Well, hello everyone. How you doing? It says I'm live and I am only assuming because the machine told me. <laughs> and man, isn't it true? The machine tells us what to do. Hello everyone. How are you? Got the echo in my head and it sounds weird. But anyway, hello, it's Monday on planet Earth. Um, and only on planet Earth. I doubt if Mondays exist in the universe. Unless uh, some idiot went out there and spoiled it. Hello, Franny. How you doing? Good to see you. Hope you had a good weekend. All the moderators. Hello, everyone. Joyce, Miss Lee, Al, CJ, Cheesesteak, Jenny, Darth, Blanca, Dragon, Soul, Fox. Hey, I like that. Knowledge Seeker, how are you? Al, always good to see you. So how is everyone? How was the strong end of your week? Good? Exciting? <laughs> uh, well, whatever it was, I thought it was good. It was good for me. Hey, tomorrow, we've got Talking with the Planets returning our good friend Patrick. And uh, I'm excited because a lot of today's lesson is going to, I think, aid us immensely. You know, allow me just to have a little open commentary before I just invoke favor on everyone. The more I read, the more I become aware of a knowledge you know, I did a video almost a year and a half, two years ago called The Secret Knowledge. And I contended there, and this goes to show you how things in your life will lead you to where you're seeking. You know, I did the Bloodline Invaders uh, series almost three years ago. And the premise of that series of programs was there's something going on. There's either someone behind the curtain, there's a council, there's something that is obviously interfering with the affairs of man to the degree that I don't think that man, humanity, homo sapiens sapiens, are as free as we think we are. Those of us who really do become free thinkers are the anomaly. Sadly, it is. And um, as I continue to read, I am now more convinced than ever before the old has become the new. Folks, I, I let me just show you. By the way, I just finished this book. I know we talked to, on our show yesterday about it, but I like this book. It's a good one. If you can get it on PDF or whatever, it's it's a good read. It really is. It uh, it's it falls right into Hermetics. Um, speaking of Hermetic, you know, I hope everyone has their copy of the Kabbalion. If you don't, I have a digital copy. Happy to send it to you as well. Is and we are still going with. Uh, Henry, we haven't left him. It became very obvious that if we were really going to understand Agrippa, we were going to have to have a better, broader foundation uh, in order to uh, work from. So I have to show you this. Dang, thing weighs like five pounds. I got this over the weekend, been studying it, and <laughs> holy crap. Uh, this is a book, as you can see, it's a, um, and I've got its companion coming as well, which is this is equal. Folks, this is probably one of the more, <laughs> I mean, when they say knowledge can be a burden, hell, I think they were talking about the weight. Um, but it's, whoa, it's a deep book. And um, we're going to, more and more as we go down this road, we'll be finding more and more. Uh, it's a heavy read. <laughs> uh, David, you're absolutely right. <laughs> uh, 
and it's a sigil. Yes, Franny. Yes. Hey, Warrior Queen, how you doing? I got a little something working for you, by the way. The 22nd is uh, Lois's Warrior Queen's birthday. We're going to do a little fundraiser and anyone's birthday today. Happy birthday to you. Mine's on Wednesday. Excited about it. You should all be excited about your birthday. You know, it's uh, exciting. So let me just invoke favor upon you. If you're listening to my voice, seeing this beautiful face, you know, I just invoke great favor upon you. May joy find you this day, and may there be an abundance of prosperity and health. A lot of people write me having health issues, and may there be nothing missing, nothing broken in your life, and full restoration. That which the canker worm has eaten, may it be restored back to you sevenfold. So uh, Trina will be back with us on Thursday, by the way. Um, so let's get back to this. There is a knowledge that, and I, I, the one thing that the only thing I can, you know, of course, I don't even think I have the, the foundation yet enough to really make a definitive uh, assertion. It's just an opinion. And what I've read thus far is deep. It's, it's like, whoa, uh, lots of warnings, but sigils, sigils are everywhere, folks. Um, we're going to find out as we get further into this When Remember, we, we, we talked, I, I told you that getting the original sigils of these spirits, they're out there. And uh, we now know a little bit about, more about Al, and we're going to get back to his book. Remember, when we read this nearly two weeks ago, oh, almost three, you know, it was talking about opening portals with sigils. We're going to be talking in the days and uh, weeks to come about Moses the Magus. Uh, powerful, power of magician this Moses was. So um, let's get into our daily invocation, our affirmation statement first, because you know what? We are on day 28. My birthday will be the 30 days that we have been confessing this over us. Uh, we've had great people that have worked on this and condensed it. Uh, Peter, I think, did this one, and, you know, it's um, fantastic. So um, I am whoever you are. <laughs> Who are you? Who are you? Uh, can say... I am no longer except the premise that the material world is the source of my needs. No more. It stops now. And may I digress here a second? So between the two books, The Journey of the Souls and The Multi-Dimensional Man, um, two different outcomes here. You know, one is firmly based into the reincarnation. You go back life after life after life, where in a lot of ways, the multidimensional man has kind of a reference to that, but it's very obvious that those of us who know that there's a higher ascension to intelligence, we apply this to the spirit realm, and that changes us, ladies and gentlemen. It, it does. I think it has a huge impact when we step through the veil. Yeah. Anyway, I am whoever you are, therefore acknowledge God, whatever God means to you. Had someone write to me, why did you abandon God? And I wrote back and I said, I never did. Just maybe the construct that I had. I had, call it the divine creator, call it the infinite being, as the only source of all of my wants and needs, thus I affirm. The world and the universe is mental, folks. That every word, thought, and action, and thought we're going to learn has so much importance, which goes forth from me, shall not return into me void without producing any consequence, but shall accomplish that which I intended, it shall produce the results which I willed. It shall then dwell within me until sent forth once again. I am conscious and aware of these truths which provide all my physical and spiritual support. Thus, 
I know that God, the infinite being, you are lavish and limitless within yourself. Within us, within me, abundance flows eternally. Restoration is ongoing. All of my needs are instantly met. Manifestation is constantly forming. Resides the divine spirit of the creator, and within me, I have no unfulfilled desires or wants. Therefore, I acknowledge the divine, the eternal creator, for the mercy, prosperity, restoration, spiritual growth, and opportunity to be is me. And of course, you can go ahead and put on to your sigil um, as I do. So allow me to get out of here because I want to get up the next one up and going fast here. There we go. All right. So um, I hope you're doing that in your life. Listen, if the spirit realm is real, are you going to have to work over there? Hi, Hadley. How you doing, dear? Hello, Monday Moon. Good to see you. Jupiter's Journey 333. Hello. I haven't seen you here before. Um, 7P, Josh, good to see you. Lucky Stone, hello. Uh, boy, Martha, good to see you. So thank you for joining in here. So let's get into this. Tomorrow, I am excited to have my good friend Patrick back and um, to go beyond what I think the first part of our experience with the planets were. It's very obvious that our ancestors had this strong belief. Um, it's, it, it appears that there was a time where, I know this sounds a little weird, but um, where the planets manifested physical bodies walked on this planet with man. Now, I don't know what genus of man that is. I don't think it was sapiens. I think there was a distant advanced race. I don't know. Uh, well, thank you. <laughs> People want to know, I am not insane, and my mother did have me tested, and trust me, I was there. I was actually in a uh, mental ward had the best time of my freaking life. But anyway, um, I digress. So if we can take the premise in these studies that the possibility could have existed that a higher intelligence would have had the capacity to easily construct atoms, molecules, begin to form matter, into material form. I think it is very plausible to think that these deities, I think it may have been in a region of space, maybe the radiation was there, the energy, but they had the ability to transmute themselves into physical form. And I think that whenever what happened and they ascended back to their positions today, um, as we look at them as planets, our ancestors, that knowledge was passed down. It was resurrected in the Renaissance era um, with people like Henry Cornelius Agrippa, uh, John Dee, um, many others. Then there was a, a time of suppression and then in the 1800s, there was another resurgence of this lost knowledge that came forth. Um, Blasky thinks of, I can think of others that became the modern day spiritualist. And from there, this carried forth all the way into the early 20th century. And then there seemed to be another suppression and here we are now, which apparently we are in the midst of this resurgence of the ancient knowledge. Now, we look at things differently. We live in a technological age. Um, so we have to begin to weigh what our ancestors wrote. Now, I will say this about uh, Mr. Regardi. I don't know where the man went. Wherever he went... I'm trying to go after that place. He obviously, 
he knew things. I mean, we we talk about ancient sigils, and I just want to show you. This is probably, and you can easily, uh, I'll get it up next time so everyone can see it. There are reproductions of this. But if you take a look at this particular sigil and the symbology behind this, this represents man apparently before our fall. And you can see the glory of man, how he's united. He stands on the crown of the woman. From the woman, there are branches that go forth as with the man. And you can see it carries all the way up into what we would call the higher realms, in which that is where man is represented. Now, when we continue to follow, and this is all Kabbalah. This is all Kabbalism. This is all from the Hebrew magician, Moses. Now, on that fall, you will see what happens. Allow me to get the next one up for you. How it is interpreted, and from there, all magic begins to assert itself. So, as you can see, here is after the fall. You see the dragon taking the predominant cardinal points. Uh, the dragon is consuming the glory. These are the suns that you can see. Um, and from that, the energy is disrupted all the way up into the higher realms. And you can see that the crown is no longer residing on man or a woman that were united. And now we are clearly divided. Um, so, well, I think it is, Gishara, I think it is. I think it's represented by consciousness. I don't think the story of, you know, we've, we've gone down that, but this is knowledge. And from that, we have to begin to extrapolate that this has an impact in the spirit realm of a certain level of consciousness. Um, yeah, they are powerful sigils, aren't they? Um, so the planets, I believe that the planets were as impacted as when man's fall of consciousness. And whatever happened, I don't know. I'm, I'm certainly trying to figure out, like a lot of others are, you know, what caused this collapse. Um, when I look at books such as, you know, uh, we'll eventually get into this one. Um, when you begin to get into, for instance, the Egyptian Book of the Dead, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, uh, two different approaches to death, the afterlife. Um, one is very heavily spell. Uh, with incantations, the other one is, to me, is a much more, um, I don't know how to say this, it, it seems to be more meditative, conscious, whereas with the Egyptians, it, it seemed to be more material. And I think that there is clearly the two dichotomies that we see. So, um, so, let me uh, this hello queen of course how you doing karen saw you the other night on brian's channel good interview so let's get into it got a lot of cover and i don't want to lollygag anymore on this so we broke off this is the um Hermetic Golden Dawn. Uh, this is the lessons we were beginning to understand of the planets. We left off with Venus. Um, and as you can see here again, all of this, at first, it seems, it seems to be a little overdoing it, right? Uh, symbols and implements, the Kabbalic number, uh, colors, uh, world of trees. But you have to say, okay, all right, this may be, you know, of a different time, of a different era, but nevertheless, it was 
important enough for the people that were writing this that the information had to come to them. Now, you can say it was passed down from one generation to the next generation, probably true. But nevertheless, it's no different. If you believe it, then it can happen. I love the, uh, the thing that it says, nothing is impossible for him who believes. All things are possible for him who believes. And as you get over into the next realm, you're going to find out just how real that is. And look at in here. So the deities that Venus is, is Hathor, Bast, Aphrodite, Venus, Ishtar, Ushas. Uh, she covers the internal sexual organs, the kidneys, the mouth, the throat, the neck, the lower regions of the back, uh, the lymphatic system, skin in regards to its functioning and breathing, absorption, uh, exaneration, nerves, muscles, and in regards to tone and relaxation. So the planetary name in English is Venus, and in Greek it is, I think that is Paphai, and in Hebrew it is Naga, uh, Noga, excuse me. Venus is joyous, it is benign. It brings good luck with love or money, comes from Venus. Kindliness and caring are part of Venus. All that makes for the concord are attributes of Venus. The beauty and vitality of the natural world and all artistic and conjugal surroundings express the influence of the sphere of Venus. It is the planet of desire. Venus is the planet of morning light. Venus is the planet of love. Venus is attributed to, and that is Zhang, I think it's Zhang Ying, uh, the tree of life. It's We'll, well, I'll show it to you. The elementary affinity is fire. The fi and it makes sense. The figure is the heptagon. The Olympic planetary spirit of Venus is Haggith. You will note her sigil at the end of this lesson. And her sigil, you start meditating. This is what I've been doing. I've been allowing myself about 15 minutes of just staring at these sigils of these planets and seeing if I can begin to make a telepathic connection to it. If sigils is very, very, and you can, I'll just put it that way, you can. Uh, we'll talk more about that with Patrick. Venus governs the internal sex organs, kidneys, mouth, as I said, throat, neck, lower regions of the back, the lymphatic system, uh, the skin, um, Venus helps in the health and well-being of the scalp and the hair. Well, I guess if, <laughs> you know, if you suffer from that ailment of the, um, uh, the rabbits dancing backwards becomes a problem. You know what a hundred rabbits dancing backwards is, right? A receding hairline. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'll appear nightly at, anyway, an ill-dignified... Venus can lead to tonsillitis, gordiers, ailments of the throat, maladies affecting the kidneys, the lymphatic system, the lumbago, the cramps, and the uh, venereal ailments. Venus is attributed to the genex. The divine name is, and get this, is Zaboth, the archangel, as Henel. The choir of angels is the Elohim. The planetary angel is Aniel. On the deities attributed to the planet of Venus is Hathor. She's pretty groovy gal. How, house of heaven, mother of light, mother of life, mother of all the gods. Wow. She who is adorned with the stars the golden goddess, the throne of peace, bearer of the system, bearer of joy, mistress of gladness, inspiration of the delight, graceful power, milk of life, face of beauty, maker of the festival, bringer of prosperity. As you, when we get better, We'll have to remember, many of you, and this goes with the health as well. In fact, the next book we have, wow, you're going to see how this 
these words, these titles become very important. And the, 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 the goal here, the lesson, is to begin to memorize these. So no matter where you walk in life, you're going to be in tune, and it, it, it invokes thought. Uh, Lady of the Tomb, Lady of the Sycamore, the South, her image is a human form of superb beauty. The goddess may be enthroned or standing. At times, she wears the festive color and of the manette, representing the joy of union. She wears the old kingdom headdress, which is surmounted by the horn and disc. Upon her brow is the Uraeus, or she may be adorned by the vulture headdress surmounted by the Uraeus and the lotus blooms. I had a dream about the lotus flower. That's all I got to say. It's anyway, I, I digress. Sometimes her human face has the ear of the cow and is framed by a very, by very long hair. She bears the onk of the papyrus scepter, uh, the scepter, excuse me. The system is especially sacred to her. It is her herald and her secret voice. Another deity often attributed to Venus is Bast, the blessed one, lady of the east, eye of Ra, flame of the sun, protector of the kings, life of the heart of the kings, powerful mother, Kindler of New Life, Lady of Springtime, the Cat Goddess, I did not know that, Beloved Lady of Bubast, she who rejoices in people, dweller in the high temple, her image appears in human form with the head of a cat. The goddess bears the system and the shield of protection. Upon the shield is often the head of loneliness. Sometimes she also bears the Corbus, the woven basket of hidden and holy things. On appearing of the fullness of her to Larry power, with the head of a lioness, the goddess wears the old kingdom headdress, which is surmounted by the Urus and bears the Ankh and the papyrus wand. Her ancient form is entirely that of a cat. Upon her breast is the eyes of the Tuhati, which symbolizes her power during the night hours. Um, some of the astrological aspects of Venus when appearing in the horoscope indicates the areas of life most strongly influenced by the desire of companionship. Venus tells us how love is expressed on a one-to-one -one basis and on the artistically creative tendencies that we all have. Uh, Venus indicates the area in which there is either ability or difficulty in closing, relating, in closely relating to others, how and what area of social, romantic, and sexual urges are expressed, and where we give love, how we give love, and how we receive joy and harmony. Okay. Um, we move right on to B. Uh, B is Mercury. Uh, some of the symbols and the implements, the winged staff, the codicus of Raphael, the hermetic scroll, the stylus hood, the sacred tomb, sandals, the lestrial vessel, bell. Um, let's go on. In Greek, it is Hermes. Well, there we go. In Hebrew, it is called Kokbab. Kobab. Mercury is a planet of intelligence. It is commutative, diverse, unresting. It has dual and even multiple aspects, but is expressive of truth. Through Mercury, we have travel, mathematics, language, calculations, analysis, learning, teaching, and expressions of the higher intellectual mind. Mercury rules my house. Thank you, Heidi. Trish and all the rest. <laughs> the visible and changeable forces of wind are apt to be the symbol of Mercury. Gifts of Mercury are oftentimes freakish or 
chance type happenings. Mercury is attributed to the Safara of Dawa. It has been, it has an elementary affinity to water, just as its co-partner, the just the dish and Jupiter also have affinity with water. The planetary figure is the octagon. The Olympic spirit of Mercury is Ophiel. Once again, you will notice a drawing of the sigil at the end of the lesson. Some maladies associated with an ill-affected Mercury can be amnesia, asthma, speech disorders, bronchitis, abnormal conditions of the thyroids, shingles, any accident or condition affecting the hands or arms, the waist, or any kind of nervous tick. The Egyptian deity of Mercury is Tuhati, otherwise known as Thoth. <laughs> The one, maker of himself, twice greatest, thrice greatest, the divine scribe, he who knows the boundaries of the world, master of knowledge, mighty in magic, he whose word lives, witness of equilibrium, arbitrator of night and day, glowing heart of raw, ibis of power, the divine peacemaker, the perfect, brasive one, bowstower of eternity. The god form of Thoth is the ibis-headed one. He wears a kilt and a headdress of the old kingdom and the collar and transverse sash. Characteristically, he bears the tablet and the stylus. In other aspects, his address, his headdress is adorned with the lunar disk and the crescent. His face is emerald green, his skin is a burnt orange. Aspects of Mercury in a house position or in a horoscope involve the way we think and help determine the kind of mind we have. The predominant manner of thinking in the primary area of mental interest is indicated by the dominant aspects made to Mercury. This planet is neutral as far as mental communication, perception, memory, and reasoning are concerned. It therefore takes on the coloring of the planet which closely aspects it in the sign and the house of which it is placed. One can achieve a high position without having a reasonably developed Mercury, for a mind is a coordinating factor or lens through which all other abilities must be focused and filtered. From a magical aspect, Mercury can be used for increased knowledge, increased ability to be able to use your magic, and thoughts for helping people with mental problems. Mercury is a very powerful planet for education, work, and school. Again, Mercury is a very powerful planet to invoke. And we're going to get on to this next one, folks. Warning after warning after warning about invoking these, these energies. Five, the next planet is Luna. In English, it is called the moon. And as you can see, um, the moon, it, and those of you who have studied with me, you know what we learned from the Samarans, from Inanna. The moon is superior in hierarchy than what the sun was. Abram, who became Abraham, his family were the chief uh, idol makers and the priest of the temple of Iana. Very powerful. Ah, in Greek, it is Mimi. In Hebrew, it is called Livana. The moon is intense, passionate and yet sometimes intrinsically cold and changeful. The moon provides us with inflection, influctuation, glamour, and dreaming. Sudden adventure, spontaneity, chill, childlike wonder, and delight are all responsible of the spear of Luna. The spear has an affinity with the fluctuating tides of the ocean, which the moon governs, 
into the ever varying waves of our life. The impulse of the moon in the work of uh, caprice, the transient pleasure, are typical manifestations of moon force. Also, the moon is responsible for fertility, but there is also a strong cleansing and purification of the moon. The moon is a very important planet in the sense that it is the reflection of the sun, and the sun is the reflection of the light of art. So even in the dark of night, the light still shines through the moon. Further, the dreams of the moon are the sphere of potential realities of the earth. Fertility, crops, and birth are all affected by the moon as well as the many times of our moods. And we all know this. Listen, anyone who works in uh, mental wards, jails, prisons, um, there, it, it even it affects people in, um, with dementia. Moon is very, very powerful. It just, uh, we all know this. Um, the sapphire of the moon is the tree of life, is the Dawasi. The moon has an elementary affinity with air. The planetary figure is the Nognagon. The Olympic spirit of the moon is full. The drawing is provided at the end of this lesson. Some of the negative effects of the moon are maladies relating to accumulations of body fluids, abscesses, tumors, female disorders, afflictions of the stomach, chest, colds, coughs, pneumonia, allergies, epilepsy, and recurring ailments in general. The Spear of Luna is under the auspices of the Dawasi. The divine name is Shaddai, El Chai. Now, Shaddai means basically multi-breasted one. Uh, the archangel is Gabriel. The choir of angels is Ashim. And the heavens of Asha is Levana. Um, let me just go on down to here. Another Egyptian god associated with the moon is the goddess Tyret the great one, mother of the sun, mistress of the gods, she who moves destiny, guardian of women, powerful helper in childbirth, she who absorbs the powers of darkness, bringer of magical protection, generous, bringer of good fortune, powerful guardian of the land, banisher of robbers, slayer of the crocodile, kindly guardian of the souls, in her image, the goddess manifests in the form of a hippo, uh, the hippopotamus, which is standing upright and exposing hanging breast. Her, hang, her hand is placed upon the saw symbol, a folded and bound papyrus that in, detonating, <laughs> denoting, excuse me, a magical protection. In her hand, she also bears the onk, which must rest upon the saw. Her right hand may also rest upon the saw symbol and may be extended holding an up, oh, unopened bud of papyrus. Her old kingdom headdress, the back of which is an ornamental continuum reaching to the ground, is surmounted by the horn in the disc of plumes. And then there's the nodes of the moons. I never really understood this, but in ancient magic, and even the, the resurgence of magic, it was still only seven planets. And of course, the moon played it. And so Pluto and Neptune uh, were pretty much left out, but not today. Um, uh, we consider in the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, Pluto and Neptune more generational and an eon top type planets that we do um, with specific planets. So just to give you, there's a north, there's a south, um, and you can read this at all. I can't do all your homework. All right, final notes. And this is important. Oftentimes, with quiet humor, the adapts of the hermetic order 
of the Golden Dawn find that outer order members will say, all I need to do is invoke a certain kind of energy. We find that they do not know the proper steps for invoking specific energies. The first step, beyond all others, is to know all the qualities, the colors, the attributes of a particular planet. Otherwise, any other steps that you take in an invocation or evocation for magical use of that planet will be in vain. So let's take a look at the symbols. And again, study these. Now that you know, here's Venus, you know where they all stand, particularly with your sigil work. All right, let's continue. The next one that we have is um, Olympic and Planetary Spirits. This is also part of the Golden Dawn um, I wouldn't say initiation courses. I guess they would be initiations. Let's continue. Symbols. Look at the sigils of these folks. And as we get further into this, we're going to get into much more of this. Um, and once you start learning it, it's it's like it's there. All right, let's go on. This is something we all need to be aware of. It's a short chapter, but powerful. Tradition holds that the spirits of the planets are evil and that the intelligences are good. Therefore, in future talisman work, the seals and the names of the intelligences should be used and all talisman talismans for good effects. Some would say that the spirits are volatile and therefore can turn on the magician and, or be of a nature that is difficult to control. There should be no worry or concern in this regard as long as the intelligence along with the choir of angels, archangels, and divine names are used. They're indicating that you really don't want to be screwing with this unless you're fully prepared, versed, and don't want any consequences. The spirits provide us with what is often called blind force. It can be used for good or evil beneficial ends or destructive ends. We will emphasize that the spirits must be under the direction of their superiors, the good intelligences. When it is necessary to do so, with keeping in the nature of the talisman or the working, the sigil of the spirit and the seals and the names of the intelligences, along with the divine names, should be placed on the talisman. Remember, it is this blind force that you must strive to control. It is powerful, but it is blind. Let us also remember that in talismanic work, it is important to inscribe the seals the sigils, the emblems, and the pentacle of the appropriate linear figure on the talisman. This is all accomplished under the planetary sign or the element under which the magical working falls. Remember to collect all the names of the Sephiroth to which the planetary spirit is attributed to. We cannot overemphasize using the archangels and the choir of angels under the auspices of the divine name. In this lesson, 
your task is to merely memorize and be able to identify on site the Olympic planetary spirit. On a side note, the newer planets are seldom, if ever, used in talismanic work. In this lesson are the seven ancient planets and the Olympic planetary spirit sigils associated with each. So you understand the hierarchy according to the old magical treatise of ancient origin, Ar Batel of Magic, the heavens at one time were divided into a total of 196 provinces or districts that were ruled by seven planetary angels. Each angel had a seal that the ancient magicians inscribed on amulets or talismans used in their magical workings. These angels are actually spirits that are called Olympic planetary spirits, which are a blind force. They, it's, you know, I think it's really how it really is. You know, we always get so wrapped up that, you know, you either choose good or, or evil, you know. We fail to understand good and evil are merely degrees opposed to each other. And at what point in that line does something that's good becomes evil? How do you move that line in your head? Yeah. Let's get on with this. This is, told you this was going to be deep. I can't see the chat room, but I bet it's interesting. I'll read it later. All right. Here we go. This is a Rathor. There's his sigil. A Rathor was said to rule over 49 provinces to change beast or vegetables into stone, turn lead into gold, possesses infinite knowledge. These are obviously alchemical blinds. Bethor. Now, some of these may, names may sound very familiar to you. I, I, I contend, I think some of us have, dealt with these spirits. Anyway, I, I digress. Uh, that, that sigil, look at that sigil, folks. That is a powerful sigil. They're all powerful, but something about, you know, Bethor, just, anyway, Bethor rules over 42 provinces, according to the ancient Arbatel. It can be wealth and friendship of kings, and important people now, okay. You see? Now, as we get more versed and as you begin to apply these forces to your magic, your sigil magic, understand what each brings. This is Falak. According to Arbatel, the angel of Mars ruled 35 provinces and could give dominion over others and victory in war. Or in war. Hmm. This is Och. Och is the angel of the sun, rules over 28 provinces. He is able to heal the sick and turn anything into gold and precious stones, an obvious blind for inner transformation. Haggith, here's another one I'm familiar with. The Olympic planetary spirit of Venus rules over 21 provinces. Haggith can transmute gold into silver and copper into gold and convert love and friendship onto the occultus. And by the way, you know, you do realize the occultist means one who sees, right? Yeah. 
Okay, Ophel, the angel of Mercury. And you see, that actually has got my name in it. I mean, you know, when I look at that, I can almost go, oh, yeah, I can see my initial. Yeah. All right, rules over 14 provinces. He can transmute Quicksilver into white stone and give speed and great knowledge. Here's fuel. The Olympic planetary spirit of the moon rules over seven provinces. It can change anything into Quicksilver, cure dropsy, and destroy the evil spirits of water and the elements that it rules. What you have received here is an outline of Olympic planetary spirits, descriptions, and what they can do according to the Arbatel of magic. However, according to the teachings of the Golden Dawn system of magic, experience has shown that these provide a blind force of energy that would be in keeping with the positive or negative nature of the particular planet involved. As you know, the nature of a planet and its attributes, and as you realize and understand the opposite or negative attributes, you will understand the potential for the sigils and the spirits. This is taking the sigils up a level. What I've been teaching you though, the, thus far is how you can imprint intent. There is yet a, another level to this. An example of this would be the planet of Mars. Mars can be good for energy, strength, and power. It can also be used for cruelty and war. The planetary spirit is directed by your will and by the divine names and intelligences included on the talisman or planetary working. They are never utilized independently. And here again, if you can learn these spirits, I bet you someone in here actually will do this and excel. I could actually probably do that. But again, here we go. Cool stuff, is it not? Now, I, I see I'm running low on time. I hope you're finding this to be vital to you. There is yet another book. Well, no way we'll ever get through this one in <laughs> any hour or two. But anyway, I want to bring it to your attention. This is the Magical Philosophy, book number four of the Planetary Magic. Um, Invoking and Directing the Power of the Planets. Uh, I have not gotten into this one. I'll just let you know. Uh, it is on my list, but I wanted to bring it out because it's part of the entire uh, study on magic, and in this case, specifically planetary magic. And just to give you a little taste of this, um, and we won't be able to get into the books of Moses. It, we, we, we will, though. All right, so as you can see, uh, the essentials of planetary magic, they get into uh, the focal points, the planets, the Kabbalah, the four worlds, the archetypes, the psych, the planetary counterparts, powers of the deep mind, vital respect, uh, reciprocity, uh, <laughs> yes, and cosmic forces. You know, reciprocity is basically meaning you put out good, you're going to get good. You put out bad, you're going to get bad. Uh, planetary characters, a legacy of the ancient world, the origins of the correspondences. This is the type of information and knowledge, folks, that allows you to have where this originated from. Now, Rodaldi did a great work here, but you know, you have to understand he came way after uh, John D. He came, he was, uh, he actually he studied with. Uh, Alistair Crowley. So he brought with him, and he died in um, 85 or 89, I think, what he knew and what we now have in print is things that you would have to, if you could have been in, allowed to enter in some of the schools of magic, of philosophy. We will be bringing these schools back uh, correspondences of Saturn, correspondences of Jupiter, 
correspondences of Mars, correspondences of Sol, correspondences of Venus, correspondences with Mercury, correspondences with Luna. Times of power, you get into each one at the key times uh, in invoking your um, energy, the force. All of these play a huge role. And we'll get into some of this. Um, again, uh, setting up things for you in your own place where you can begin to practice your own magic. Um, we will get to a place where you can actually put, let me turn this to appraise this right, um, energies, beings that will literally protect your place where you practice at. You have to command them, but they will. So anyway, as you can see, this is, and there is one other book that goes with this that we'll get into. Uh, this is Planetary Talismans, and we'll get into this as well. So there you go. Um, hope this has helped. It's good stuff, isn't it? Deep. And, you know, you just got to, you know, whether you like it or not, I don't know, you know, don't reject it just because it may go contrary to some of our thoughts. But folks, this is the type of stuff that will raise you up when you become your own magician, able to understand how the forces work. To me, I hated that. In my 30s, I was so, folks, I would go places just to think this. I couldn't understand why there was this conflict in me. You know, I was getting what I thought was the truth, but deep down inside, I could never find any peace. And it was like there was something that I was yearning for that just always, I had used to have this recurring dream where um, I know it sounds funny, but I was trying to eat a piece of chocolate. <laughs> and I, I, and in this dream, I could remember having it in my hand, but I could never get it to my mouth. And uh, <laughs> yes, Darth Raven, it is weird that those sigils sound familiar, isn't it? Well, thank you, Jupiter's Journey. Uh, Wait to open your third eye. Well, okay, well, that sounds good. And right now, um, I always go by the life uh, adage, every journey starts with one step, and we're taking steps. And thank you. Thank you for your generosity, and may it be returned back to you a hundredfold. So, um, folks, this is, this is getting good. We're not going to stop. We're getting, I think now you're understanding where we're going and how we're going to get there. And um, by the way, I'm going to load this up on uh, my Google Drive, and I will have that book ready to go. Uh, isn't that interesting, Franny? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Alfred. Uh, a lot of the sigils uh, I showed uh, embody self-actualization. Yes, 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 yes. They do. And when you and, and Franny, I'm telling you, if you get in your room and you just meditate, just quiet the mind and find which one really draws you, uh, wow. I mean, it will start speaking to you. <laughs> uh, well, folks, um, <laughs> yeah, we do need to get, uh, get smart glasses. <laughs> Uh, this is cool. Well, I hope this has been at least informative. Um, and whether it's been fun or not, that's up to the individual. I find it to be fun. It's like uh, a kid in a uh, candy store. It's just, it's interesting information. It's information that when you first read it, just sounds completely cockamamie. I mean, it's like, where did, where, where's person's head thinking about this? But as you get more into it, you're going, Oh, yeah. And then you begin to see things in life and you go, yeah. 
And then all of a sudden, the the dominoes start to fall. Anyway, all right, folks, thank you so much. Um, Warrior Queen, have you gotten up your uh, people yet? We're going to get you on, and we'll do not only a fundraiser for you, but uh, we're going to help you get up to your uh, membership. It's gotten tough with uh, YouTube. It really has, and I hope it's just a phase. Uh, well, everyone, happy journey on your magical journey. It's as magical as you want to make it. It's magical no matter what. But I'm figuring if we're already on it, let's make the most of it. Yeah, that's what I say. We can talk about what's happening in the space and outer space and everything else and the world of politics. But folks, when the insanity starts to become so insane, this is the stuff that you will be able to use. I mean, do you ever ask yourself, why are there so few magicians? Why are there so few sorcerers? Why are there so few sorceresses that are at the high rankings? I ought to tell you something. And you know something I have found about sorcerers, particularly ones that I'm talking to now, and I have one sorceress, um, they, they don't lack for anything. They don't. Things have a way of coming to them. I think that's where all of us would like to be, wouldn't you? All right, folks, much love to you. I'll see you tomorrow with Patrick. Looking forward to it. Uh, send your questions if you like, and tomorrow should be a, I think, <laughs> I think it's just going to be far out, no doubt. All right, folks. Thank you all. All right. Bye-bye.